going to begin a sermon series on the book of Titus. And I would love for you to go to 1 Titus chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And after we're done reading these verses, then we'll get into an introduction. The Bible says in Titus 1, 1 through 4, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledge, acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but has in due times manifested His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. May God bless the reading of His Word. Amen. As we get into this series of messages, I want to talk about uh, just a quick introduction of the book of Titus, and you'll see it here. that The book of Titus offers valuable insights that can strengthen our relationship with Christ. It's only three chapters, but they're very in-depth. Not only within the church, but they can strengthen our relationship with each other. And it's noteworthy that the, the Titus mentioned in, the, in this book, the, the, the guy by the name of Titus mentioned here, is the same individual that was referred to by Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. In that passage, it sheds some light on the background of Titus, of who we're going to be talking about. When Paul addresses his letter to the Galatians, he states, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So right off the bat, automatically, we understand here that Titus is not a Jew, but he's a Gentile. He's a Gentile that had been converted to Christianity and had joined the church during his time. So this passage not only highlights Titus, his collaborative efforts with Paul in the ministry of the church, but also underscores his faithful and significant role that he had as a representative to address the conflicts that plagued the Corinthian church. He was a man that worked together with Paul. So Paul is writing to somebody that he shares a common faith with. This is evidence. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 through 7. Listen to what it says here. And we're just giving you an introduction of the book of Titus. It says, Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Again, Paul mentions Titus here. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. So he continues to say, when he told us, your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me so that I rejoice the more. Now we don't know if when Titus joined up with Paul and came to him, but what Paul is telling us here that Titus for one way or another, met with him and shared with him the joys of the Corinthian church, what was going on. But we know that the church in Corinth had a lot of problems, but at this time, Titus shares the good things that are going on in the Corinth church. What I'm trying to show you here is that Titus played a very important role with Paul in the ministry. This passage of 2 Corinthians, where we read, also highlights the deep gratitude to God for the arrival of Titus, who brought encouragement and good news. Paul rejoiced upon hearing about the prayers and the love of the Corinthian church, as reported by Titus. This account underscores Titus' faithfulness as a valued ministry partner with Paul, who had proven himself to be a committed worker for the expansion of the kingdom of God and the church. Now, all of this happened approximately... Listen to this. In the year 63 or 64. So we're talking about almost five years before the destruction of the temple in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the year 70. So before this big destruction, 
Paul is working with Titus. And sometime after this, he left Timothy in Ephesians, in, in Ephesians, and Paul and Titus traveled on to Crete, the island of Crete. So what you see up here is the island of Crete. Now, I will add this here. The Cretan people, or the Crete people, the people of Crete, were known historically as barbarians. And the Romans used to hire them to be assassins for them. They were ruthless. They were so ruthless. And as we begin to study the book of Titus, we're going to notice that Paul characterizes the, the people from Crete in a different way. And you're going to, know, and you're going to read it and you're going to say, whoa, that kind of sounds like our modern time when he begins to share who they were and how they acted. So they were assassins. They were ruthless people in that area. But guess what? The gospel had reached this small island. Now, the Apostle Paul gives a greeting here, so let's begin. Titus chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll just, in this beginning series, we'll just look at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Make it a lot easier for us to understand it. In these opening verses, we witness Paul's identification of himself as what? Listen to what he says. Paul, a servant of who? Of God. So this raises the question, what did Paul mean by this? And why did he begin his letter by saying, Paul, a servant of God? You know, he used the Greek word here, doulos, which means slave. So when Paul is saying that he is a servant of God, Paul is saying, Paul, a slave of God. He's using the word doulos. So Paul was not only setting the example for Titus, but it was also conveying the full weight of what it meant to be a servant of God in the position that he held in the church. By being a doulos, he was saying, in other words, hey, I'm a slave of God. So if we were to read it in modern terms, where Paul is saying, I, or Paul, a servant of God, he's saying, Paul, a slave of God. And that word doulos in the Greek meant somebody that has intentionally become a slave. That's like if I, if I went to a, a person's home and I asked for a job and I say, hey, I'm going to give all my rights up to you, Sister Joanne, and I'm going to be your slave. I'm going to be your servant. And whatever you say, I will do it. I'm giving up these rights. So it's no longer my will, but it is the will of who? Sister Joanne in that sense. But Paul is saying here, Paul, a servant of God, a doulos of God, a slave of God. So Paul is telling us here, and he's showing Timothy, I mean Titus, and he's showing us clearly that he's given up his will to serve who? To serve God. So Paul is saying, in other words, Paul, a slave of God. Now this is, serves as a constant reminder that in leadership, in the church, regardless of one's position or level, we are called to be servants of God in all things. Paul's example of willingly giving himself over to the use of God as a show, serves as a model for us. We make the decision to serve God. Paul made the decision to serve God. He was fully committed. So when Paul says, Paul, a servant of God, right away you notice that Paul is saying, hey, I am subject to God. And we talked about this in our Sunday school. Paul found his purpose. What was his purpose? Not my will, but God's will. Not what I want to do, but what God wants me to do. And listen to this. Paul is speaking to a congregation of people that were used to slavery in his time. They were used to seeing slaves all over the place. Some were forced labor slaves. This is why, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna jump here real quick, but this is why Paul, on one occasion, Paul said, he said that we're slaves of Christ. And then he told the overseers 
to be careful how you take care of the church of God. He was making a contrast between the, the overseers that were taking care of the Roman slaves and the overseers that were supposed to take care of the slaves of Christ. And he was saying the overseers that take care of the church of God don't do it like the Romans do it. They do it the way God wants them to do it. And Paul is saying, Titus, I'm a servant of God. I think that when you begin to read 1 Titus, that's the first thing that should pop to your head is Paul, he says, that's my name. And then he says his title. He doesn't say apostle first. He doesn't say bishop first. He doesn't say overseer first. The first thing that comes out of his mouth is servant of God. That's a great difference. Slave of God. Subject to God. Now, isn't that a lot different from the time we live in today where everybody says, I want to do whatever I want to do. You don't tell me what to do. You heard the saying today, the liberal saying, my body, my choice. Huh? Whatever I want to do with it, it's my, it's my... That's the time we're living in. And it's a, it's a great difference between what Paul is saying here than the times we are living today. Now, we continue to read. Let's continue to read. Paul, verse 1, a servant of God. Then he says, and an apostle of who? Jesus Christ. So Paul says first he's a servant of God, and then he says he's an apostle. Paul assumes another title to describe himself, one that emphasizes his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. What was an apostle? An apostle was a messenger of God. An apostle was one that had been commissioned by Jesus. And Paul conveys to Titus that he is not only a servant of God, but a messenger of God who has been granted authority by Jesus himself. Now, I do want to say something here regarding Paul's claim to be an apostle. It's noteworthy to, to notice this today because we live in a time where a lot of people are going against what the Bible says. And you know, one of the arguments today is, how can Paul be an apostle if one of the requirements was that he had to be commissioned by Jesus directly and that he had to be a witness to the resurrection physically? But Paul was never any of those two. Well, we don't see it the way we see it when we read the Bible. But how can Paul claim then to be an apostle? So in other words, He's a fake apostle, as they say today. But I want you to notice something. And I'm going to read this here, these notes. We are well aware that Paul's story, we all know his story on the way to Damascus. And it's clear from the New Testament that he was not one of the original 12 apostles who were directly called and commissioned by Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the New Testament account of the resurrection indicates that Paul was not even present as a witness to the risen Christ along the other disciples. He wasn't there with them at all. Given these facts, one might argue that Paul had no right to call himself an apostle when he directs himself to Titus. But as we examine the scriptures, it will become evident to us that Paul had a unique calling and an authority as an apostle. Despite not being one of the original 12, Paul was commissioned directly by Jesus as evidenced by his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he calls him. Second, Paul was recognized as an apostle by the other apostles, Peter, James, and John. That's beautiful. Watch. Go with me to the book of Galatians. Let's go to the book of Galatians real quick. And I, I have to point this out because we need to understand everything Paul is saying here when he's speaking to Titus. I'm hoping that we can finish this first part. If not, well, the Lord will give us time. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. When you have it, say amen. This is Paul speaking. Listen to what Paul is saying. <laughs> I love this. He says, then 14 years. So Paul is sharing a story here. He says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem 
So this time he goes to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. There's Titus again. So this time Paul, Barnabas, and Titus are going together. Verse 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. And I went up by revelation. So in other words, who sent him? Jesus. He told, hey, go to Jerusalem. So verse 2, and I went up to Revela by revelation and communi communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So he goes to who does he speak this to? To the apostles. And he says, hey, I went to them and I share with them what I was preaching. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So he's like, I want to, I'm going to tell them what I've been teaching. Verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no manner to me. God accepted no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. It's amazing what Paul is saying here. Verse 7. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised was committed unto me, as the gospel of the, of the circumcision was unto Peter. So in verse 7, he says, hey, they recognized that I had a calling that was special, and that calling came through Jesus Christ. Verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. What is he saying in verse 8? The same one that called and commissioned Peter had also commissioned me to be an apostle. Amen. Verse 9. And when James, Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, in other words, they were top leadership, what happened? perceived the grace that was given unto me. So they were able to discern the calling of God on Paul at that moment. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. What does that mean? They accepted them. And to a certain degree, I may even, may even say that in verse, in, in verse 9, Paul became a member of the church. Listen. Listen to what verse 9 says. I'm going to read it one more time. And when James... Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, that they unto the circumcision. Only they would, that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. What's the difference between Paul calling himself an apostle? And if somebody were to come to this local church and say they're an apostle, what's the difference? What, what would we say? Because they would say, well, God called me also and commissioned me, and I'm an apostle. You know what the difference is? That even though Paul was called, the original 12 confirmed that Paul had been called an apostle. So there's no way that somebody can come today and say, I'm an apostle, because we don't have the original 12 to confirm and discern that you've been called. So they already laid down the foundation for it. We're just building on top of the apostles' doctrine that they received from Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I'm a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we have confirmed that, yes, Paul was an apostle. Now, he continues to read, according to the faith of God's elect... Listen to what Paul is saying. So he's saying, Paul is servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he says, according to the faith of God's elect. Now, based on Paul's calling as a servant of God, an apostle, we too have placed our trust in the faith of the gospel. This faith is built upon the solid foundation of the word of God and the death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and our faith is rooted also where? In the divine revelation we have received of God's church. If not, we would be out of here, Sister Joanne. We'd be somewhere else today. 
We'd be in the midst of a mega church where they have everything they want. But we are here today because we have a divine revelation of God's church. Amen? And that's what it's saying here. Paul is saying it was according to the faith of God's elect. What is this divine revelation? It's not only the mystery of the redemption of Jesus Christ, but also the fact that Jesus would establish His church and it would endure despite any opposition. The church would endure. Today the church still stands and continues to move forward towards perfection. What is perfection? A mature state. A spiritual state in the eyes of God. And this is the testament of the faithful of God's elect that when the church has made herself ready, we will be raptured away. And Paul is saying this. So Paul says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, comma, according to the faith of God's elect, comma, and then he says, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. What does this mean? That it's not enough to simply acknowledge the truth. Everybody can say, oh, I believe in the truth of the gospel. But it's one thing to acknowledge it, and it's another thing to really live the truth. And what, does, what did he mean by acknowledging here in the Greek? It meant to thoroughly discern the truth. This is why it's so important today that we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be able to discern the truth of God's Word. Without it, it's impossible for us to understand what God has laid down in front of us. Because we will begin to, to, to judge things according to our own perspective, our own ideas, our own thoughts, and at the same time tell the Holy Ghost He's not invited with us. But what is it saying here? The acknowledging of the truth. Now, who is the truth? Jesus Himself spoke of the Holy Spirit and He referred to it as the Spirit of truth. And stating that when He comes, He will guide us into all truth. So what, how important is it for the Holy Ghost today to be with us? It's to reveal to us the truth of God's Word. To provide to us discernment. To be able to discern the truth from falsehood. We're just reading verse 1. <laughs> That's just verse 1 of what Paul is saying. Verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now all believers in Christ, we understand that eternal life has been promised to us. How many of you believe that? Eternal life have been, uh, eternal life. Titus 1 2 affirms that God cannot lie and that there is no falsehood in him. God is complete truth. We are able to discern the truth only by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we have placed our faith and absolute truth in Jesus. Now, despite ongoing debates today, you go to YouTube and you'll see it. A lot of people say absolute truth does not exist. They say that. Other people say, well, you believe one thing, I'll believe another thing, and we'll just tolerate each other. Somebody's got to be wrong. We can't both be right. Somebody has to have absolute truth. And in order to really understand what absolute truth is, it is to discern absolute truth through the spirit of truth. A carnal Christian cannot understand the truth. He must be led by the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's important to know that Jesus isn't simply claiming to know the truth, but rather He is asserting that He embodies the truth. He is the truth personified. It's not a concept. It's not an idea. It is a person. The truth is found in Jesus. So He says, in hope of eternal life, 
which God cannot lie before the world began. He's talking about Jesus. And as believers, we can trust in the absolute truth of Jesus Christ because He is not just any teacher, He is not just a philosopher, but the Son of God who came to reveal the truth of God to us by placing our faith in Him. We're able to gain access to the truth that will lead us to eternal life. Verse 3. But he, but, but have in due times, listen to this. Just with the adding of the S to the word times tells us that it's talking about a span of time. But, in, but he, but have in due times manifested his word. Not Brother Nathan's word, but his word through preaching. Then there's a comma which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. What is Paul saying here to, Timothy, to Titus? Paul emphasizes the importance of the preaching of the Word of God to manifest the significance of the gospel message. Paul tells Titus that God has manifested His Word, but who is the Word? It's the question. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the Word, and it is through Him that God has revealed the truth of the message of the Gospel. But listen to what Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and verse 2 says. Go with me real quick to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Remember, Paul tells Titus here, listen to what Paul tells him. He says, but hath in due times, in verse 3, manifested His Word through preaching. So in Hebrews chapter 1, the moment I read this in Titus, I'll tell you what happened. The moment that I read it, I said, Hebrews. It, it came right to my head. Hebrews chapter 1. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says. God, who at sun-dry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the Father by the prophets. God spoke to His people through the prophets, but listen to what verse 2 says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by who? His Son. Hallelujah. Whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He has made the worlds. Yesterday they crowned King Charles in England, but we already have a king. His name is Jesus. Amen? And what does it say here? Hath in these last days spoken unto his, uh, to us through his son. And how does his son speak to us today in 2023? Listen, through his word. This is God speaking to us today. And I know that sometimes... We want to get tickled like that man and open up the Bible and say, Lord, speak to me right now. And at the moment, read and say, oh, well, I don't like that one, Lord. <laughs> and go back and do something else. But God speaks to us through his word. And, and you know what? There may be times where you tell God, God, speak to me right now. You open the Bible and God will speak to you. God does whatever he wants. But in him, this letter, Paul affirms that the preaching of the Word of God has been entrusted to Him by the commandment of our Savior in verse 3 of the book of Titus. I'm going back to Titus chapter 1, verse 3. But hath in due times manifested His Word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. As believers, we too can testify to the same truth. While not all of us may be ordained ministers or teachers in the church, but we can still share the gospel message through our personal testimonies, what God has done in our lives, and the promises we're holding on to for the future and our hope of eternal life. That's the message you can preach to somebody. Now, we'll finish off in verse 4. Titus chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus, and I love what Paul says, my own son after the common faith. Can you just feel those tender words of Paul? Imagine being Titus and you get the letter and you open it up 
And it says, to Titus, my own son. I don't know if Titus had a father in real life, but he sure had a spiritual father in Paul. Grace, he says, comma, mercy, comma, and peace, comma. Those three separate words. From who? From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. What does Paul express here? He expresses confidence in Titus as a spiritual son. And maybe, I don't know, maybe Paul was the one that led Titus to salvation. Could be because if he calls him his spiritual son, then there had to be something there. Maybe he won Titus for the Lord and he discipled him. You see how beautiful this is? Discipleship is not just winning people and then let them sit on the pews. No, you win them and you disciple them. You help them on the road so that they learn to do the same thing for others. And Paul calls him his spiritual son. This mutual trust that Paul and Titus have is a beautiful thing, enabling Titus to work effectively as a leader in the church. This trust is also essential for you and I to work in the church and allow us to help others to grow in their faith and understand the Word of God. I know that there's times of revival and preaching on subjects that will help us, but there's also times of instruction and helping us to learn and to grow and mature spiritually in God. And Paul reminds Titus that their faith, now he, he puts them together. He says, now, I'm not going to talk about me, Paul says. We're going to talk about us. And what does he say? He reminds him that their faith is based on God's grace, on God's mercy, and on God's peace. Isn't that wonderful? Every time I pray, I say, Lord, thank you for your grace, your love, and your peace that he gives us. Which comes from God the Father and are demonstrated through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. You ever had those moments in life where everything, you just feel the weight of everything just come on you? And then when you step into your closet to pray and you begin to just pour out your heart to God, you feel that Jesus is there. And when you get up, you just feel light. Like if all that weight just came off you. And this is exactly what Paul is telling him, that our faith, our common faith, is found in the grace and mercy and peace of God. In essence, Paul's confidence in God through Jesus is a reminder to us of trusting one another and God's divine authority as we work to share the message of the gospel to grow one with another. You and I can also have that same faith today. Amen? I want to read Titus 1 through 4 one more time, and we'll finish here. Paul, a servant of God, we talked about him being a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We talked about his unique calling. According to the faith of God's elect, we talk about that faith of God's church and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. We talked about the, the acknowledging of the truth only by the direction of the Holy Ghost. In hope of eternal life, we talked about that being our eternal life that we hope for. And we talked about it, which God, that cannot lie, He promised it before the world began. He promised it. It's been in His plan. Verse 3, but has in due times manifested His word through preaching. What does that mean? Through preaching, through teaching, through testimony. It's been manifested through His word. Who is the word? Jesus is the word. So in other words, God has manifested His plan through Jesus. And Jesus manifested it to the apostles. And today we continue with the doctrine of the apostles and we manifest it to the world until the rapture. And in verse 4, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith. He tells Titus, hey, we share the same faith. 